All right, we got a nice recap here, all of these engagement types, and we're going to see, here's where we're going to get into our bunch of wonderful graphics and charts, comparing everything that we kind of went through. So you can think of all of the slides before as a nice overview. Obviously, hopefully you'll learn from those, you, you take that in. But here is like a catch-all. Here, we're going to compare them all side by side and talk about the reasons why. Definitely memorize these following slides. We're going to have a bunch of them. We're going to have a good time with it. Do some push-ups, do some... Uh, Go for a little jog, get the blood flowing, whatever you need to do. Do some wall sits, you know, I, I always like to get the blood flowing, uh, jog in place, jumping jacks, whatever you need to do. If you're not uh, the exercising type, go drink some coffee, go pet your dog, go pet your cat, because we are coming in for a fun time. Let's start off and begin by seeing which engagements are going to require independence because there is a level of assurance provided, and that is going to be the audit and review. Reviews having limited assurance and audits having reasonable assurance. There is no insurance provided in these two engagement types. And if we see something with none, it, means it doesn't apply to any of these engagement types. We may see that later on and hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Second point here, management's responsibilities and the CPA's responsibilities should be documented and signed by both parties. Like I said, it doesn't matter if you are an accountant or if you're in any industry, whenever you're entering into a contract to do work for someone or have work done for you, get it in, in writing, document responsibilities on both ends, understand who is responsible for what. CPA should perform cutoff tests on sales and purchase transactions. Well, what are these? These are substantive procedures. And as such, substantive procedures are only done in an audit. And because of that reason, we would eliminate all these other options. Next up, the CPA should obtain an understanding of the entity's industry and accounting practices and principles. That is going to be all the engagement types. You want to get an idea before you go in. What kind of transactions should we see? What's their operating environment? Is the whole industry as a whole going down? Is it the uh, video rental in-person business? Maybe that's uh, not doing too hot, uh, right? Something like that. You want to understand if the industry as a whole is doing well, because then you'd expect to see revenues increase, right? So just kind of getting the idea where you go in so you have a level of understanding and you have expectations. Next up, the CPA should design and perform analytical procedures and make inquiries in order to obtain limited assurance. Limited assurance is specifically and explicitly and importantly tied to review. This is going to be just a review because audit is reasonable assurance and there's no assurance for these other types. Next up, the CPA does not need to obtain an understanding of internal control for the purposes of assessing control risk. We only have that audit. So think about it. Audit risk, control risk is a part of the audit risk formula. That is something that will, you know, obviously we dive into in the audit risk lesson a lot more, but that's kind of the rationale there. Next up, the CPA should use analytical procedures. Okay, ding, ding, ding. And it's a basis for inquiry. What do we do in reviews? We do only analytical procedures and inquiry. And then analytical procedures and inquiry are just one of the many things that we do in an audit. The CPA should read the financial statements for any indications of departure from gap. That's going to be for all the cases. We're going to have a general idea, just like we should also read the financial statements. And if we see anything glaring and blatantly incorrect, if we see any blatant or discover fraud or material misstatement, no matter what the engagement type, you're, you're going to say something. The CPA should verify that the statements agree or reconcile with the accounting records. The compilation and preparation, you do not do that. However, in an audit and review, you do enough procedures to actually test that. And lastly, for this slide, we've got one more. When using a special purpose framework, such as IFRS or cash basis, the report should include a separate paragraph stating that the financial statements are prepared in accordance with that special purpose framework. Just as we go along, this is increasing levels of responsibility from a preparation to an audit. You see, with these types of engagements, we're going to have a little bit more responsibility. All right, last one for this format, and then we'll see some other wonderful slides. If not independent, the report should so indicate with the use of an extra paragraph, but the rest of the report would be standard. Well, let's think about this for a second. You need independence in our audits and our reviews. So that's not negotiable. So we wouldn't have the situation. Preparations, we don't need to be independent and we don't need to talk about it. However, in compilations, regardless of your independent status, you need to assess it and then actually mention it in the report. And as a note, this could obviously very easily be a SIM, right? Easily format this to be a SIM and you might have to select which engagements this applies to. So I would for sure be familiar, memorize this here. Next up, when the financial statements omit substantially all disclosures, the report should include a paragraph pointing out that fact, but would otherwise be a standard report. 
we are not worried about that in audits and reviews because in these cases, we cannot omit substantially all the disclosures. And same with preparations. This is only going to be an option when we get to compilations. When the CPA becomes aware of a material departure from the framework, the CPA discloses the departure in a separate paragraph that is going to apply to audits and reviews. That is going to something that is not going to apply to compilations and preparations. Next up, the CPA is required to assess the risk of fraud. Now, as I mentioned, if you find fraud, if you just kind of stumble across it, right, you are going to deal with it then, no matter what the engagement type is, you're going to bring it to someone's attention. However, in auditing, you actually need to assess the risk of fraud. And then next up, we have the CPA should perform analytical procedures to test the accounting records by obtaining corroborative evidential matter. All this means you need to get evidence to corroborate the accounting assertions, and that is going to be done in auditing because you do not do substantive procedures. You do not corroborate anything unless it's an audit. Next, we have inquire of related party transactions. And since this is an inquiry of an internal party, this is an inquiry of management and within the client, you can do that for a review and as well as you would do that for an audit. The CPA should send a inquiry to the entity's lawyer. That is an inquiry of an external third party. That would be only done in an audit. The management representation letter is not required. And that is only going to be in a compilation and preparation. You're going to need that in both an audit and a review. The CPA should confirm individually significant receivable balances with customers. That is inquir inquiring of third parties. That is external inquiries. That is substantive procedures. And as such, that is an audit procedure. Next up, a CPA should review subsequent bank statements for evidence of cash deposits. That is, again, a substantive procedure. And lastly here, the CPA's report should include the scope limitation that led to a step down in level of service. Well, let's think about this for a second. If you had a change in the engagement type and it was a step down in the level of service, meaning you went from an audit to a review or a review to a compilation, et cetera, going on, should, you should include the scope limitation. Well, you're not going to have a report because you're going to withdraw, disclaim an opinion, so get the heck out of there. That's the reason why it would be none of them. All right, moving on to what we've got, some other types of graphs, charts. Take notes of these, screenshot them, have a good time. Let's keep rolling along. Let's talk about procedures that are going to be done in these particular engagement types. We've got compilations, examinations, and agreed upon procedures. And while these two are covered in other lessons, it's just nice to compare relatively similar engagement types. Now let's talk about it. When you have prospective financial statements in a compilation report, and presumably in that compilation engagement, you're going to assemble those financial statements, but you're not going to do anything other than that. In an examination, you're actually going to evaluate them. And then lastly, in an agreed upon procedure, you're going to apply specific procedures to them. Next up, what about the responsible party's assumptions? In the same case, we're going to, in a compilation, we're going to assemble them. In an examination report, we're going to evaluate and agreed upon procedures. These should be included in the prospective financial statements. Next up, are financial statements and significant assumptions in conformance with AICPA guidelines and compilations? As we have stated, we are going to just look for obvious errors. We're not going to do significant testing. We're not giving an opinion. However, in an examination, we do, right? If we just come across something in a compilation, that's fine, right? We'll, we'll make note of it. We're going to bring it to someone's attention. But in an examination, that's when we're actually giving an opinion. And for an agreed upon procedure, that is going to be a disclaimer. We're not going to worry about that there. Next up, obtain agreed upon scope from engaging party. Not going to be applicable to any of these except within an agreed upon procedure. We're going to do that prior to the issuance of the report. Let's see a little bit more here. What are our procedures? What are those looking like for these engagement types? So first for a preparation, this again gives no assurance. It's a non-attest engagement. First, we are going to establish an understanding, and this builds upon itself. So these items are going to be applicable to all of the following, right? And then additionally for compilation, this is what's added on. And then additionally for review, these items are added on. So what we're seeing here in the first row, these are items that apply to all three engagement types. So for all three engagement types, we're going to establish an understanding with the client. We're going to do that for every engagement type, not just these three. We want to have a knowledge of accounting principles and practices. And if we don't have those, well, you better go out and go get them. We want to have an understanding of the client's business, as we've seen a few times here. Obviously, read the financial statements. And if you're doing something like a review, you're obviously reading the financial statements in addition to doing those procedures. And lastly, evaluate and document the results. Again, those are all actions taken for any of these engagement types. 
Next up, we have compilation. Well, what do we add on to that? Well, we are going to create an appropriate report that's specific to a compilation and a review. And then we're going to include all components of a preparation, right? It's going to say includes all that. What I was saying to you before, a review is going to include all the, comp uh, the components of a compilation and preparation. Lastly, here we get to our review. And within our review, we have limited negative assurance. This is an ad test engagement. We're going to make inquiries only within the organization, remember. So there we go. We are going to perform analytical procedures. Very good, very good. We are going to obtain a client representation letter. And that is going to be in addition to what we've got. There's a great deal of overlap here, as we see within these engagement types. Each level of service is going to require progressively more procedures. And this is just a great way to see these different SARS engagements, these different engagement types, and how they overlap and build upon each other. Kind of like you ordered the first course, and maybe you want to build upon that at a restaurant, right? Using my restaurant analogy, you're going to get your add ons for your meal. All right, friends on the journey, welcome to our wonderful big chart with all of our engagement types, pretty much every engagement you're going to see throughout the entire exam. And as such, today we are going through our preparation, compilation, and review. So we're going to isolate these preparations, compilations, and review over here. Let's go through, and I'll reference some of the other ones, but obviously we've got whole lessons for those other engagement types as well. We're going to see what standards they follow. Generally, it's going to be SARS, but here we have possible SSAE for reviews if we have a review of MD and A. Next up, what assurance level is provided? Memorize this, memorize everything you see here. We've got a moderate level of assurance. And what is that moderate level for a review? That is going to be limited assurance. We've also got this concept of negative assurance. Don't worry about that yet. Preparations, compilations, they are not going to give any assurance. Now, what's the opinion or kind of the conclusion for a review? You're going to give a conclusion and there is just no opinion at all. You're going to give a report for a compilation. You're going to give a, a sort of assessment findings at the end, but not a report. Now, what is restricted use? Nothing for preparations. However, we see perspective and perspective for review and for compilations. Now, perspective financial statements, these are essentially projections. These are forecasts for what the financial statements could look like in six months, in a year. Let's think about why these are restricted. If you are Apple and you have a lot of investors, right? People want to make money on your stock. And what's going to happen if you create financial statements for six months from now? Obviously, that's in the future and it hasn't happened yet. And regardless of whether or not those financial statements look good or look bad or in the middle, that's a problem because if an investor picks that up and it's not restricted use, right? And it's not locked down somewhere. If someone picks that up and makes an investing decision based on those financial statements that are not accurate, well, that's a problem because they are using information that was not intended for them. So anytime there is financial statements that are not for general use, that are restricted, we are going to obviously restrict the report. We're going to list on the report that it's restricted. We're going to also just try to not let it get out. Right? I mean, you're going to put that on lockdown essentially. Uh, so that is why we are going to have restricted use for prospective statements in these situations. Now, is independence required? We see that independence is required for a lot of engagements here. Really, the only engagements where it's not required are preparations and compilations. And as we know, with compilations, they have that special caveat where you can be independent or not independent. You just have to disclose whether you are or are not. What about issues in the engagement? Are you going to report them? Now, generally, yeah, just be a good citizen. <laughs> just report your issues. It's not required in preparations, but yeah, I'll just be, be a good little practitioner and tell them if you find any issues. Similarly, compilations, reviews, now, obviously in reviews and, and audits, you're actually going to actively look for any issues. But if you find issues in these activities, just know you're going to report them and you're not required in preparations. But in reality, it would just be a nice thing, wouldn't it? Next up, we got what types of procedures are done? Well, we know reviews are analytical procedures and inquiries of management. For preparations, we're going to have inquiry of significant judgments in financial statements. And what procedures can be done during compilation that are, is also going to be analytical procedures and inquiries of management. However, this is very much more heavier on the review side. These are going to be much lighter on these less intensive engagement types. What are our thoughts? When are we going to disclaim an opinion? Well, the accountant doesn't express an opinion here. There's, there's no concern. We're not, there's no opinion to disclaim, right? And we are going to, in a review, state that a review is less in scope than an audit. So accordingly, we don't express an opinion. This is what we are going to say. When we disclaim an opinion, we just get out of there. Goodbye. Now, when do you assess fraud risk? As we mentioned prior, that is going to only be during an audit. When do you consider internal controls? That is only going to be for an audit as well. And then when do you need a management representation letter? 
Well, that is going to be when you're doing an audit or a review. Nice, wonderful take here. Make sure you have this memorized, make sure you're familiar with it, and you will do well. Let's take a look at our nice last wonderful chart here. We've got a few engagement types that we've been seeing over and over. We've got our preparations, our compilations, reviews, and audits. Now we see here that preparations and compilations, these are going to be only for non-issuers. There's no level of assurance, and these are going to follow our SARS standards. For review engagements, we can have them following SARS, statements on auditing standards, and ECAOB rules. Lastly, for our audits, these can be for non-issuers or issuers, right? You're going to have to follow AICPA and PCAOB guidelines here. You're going to give reasonable assurance and reviews. For non-issuers, that's when you're going to follow SARS. For non-issuers, you can issue interim financial statements. You can review those. And for issuers, you can also review interim financial statements. Now, what knowledge is going to be required? This is going to build on itself. We're going to see here that preparations and compilations are going to require a knowledge of accounting principles and practices of the industry, general understanding of a client's business, and then review engagements are going to require this plus additional plus additional for audits. Now, this isn't really anything specific. It just says plus increased knowledge of the business. And that kind of makes sense because each is kind of more work. Now, as you do more work and you have more responsibility, you're going to need to understand more about the general business, about the general market, how the company works. And we see here that lastly, for audits, you need extensive knowledge of the economy, the industry, and the client's business. Just as you're going to do more work for them and have more responsibility in your work, you're going to want to learn more and more about all the factors that impact it. Now, what about inquiry and analytical procedures? Are they required? Preparations and compilations, it's not required, although as we've seen compilations, you'll likely do those. And it's really not required unless the information is questionable, if you're skeptic about something. For reviews, this is going to be required, inquiries of internal personnel and analytical procedures. And lastly, audits got everything, as we've seen throughout the exam, and we'll continue to see, audits got extensive amounts of procedures done. What about if there are any disclosures required by GAAP that are omitted? For preparations, you may omit those, but you need to disclose that they're omitted in the financial statement. For compilations, you may omit most of them without restricting the use of the report. For review engagements, all of these disclosures are required, or if they're not disclosed, you're going to have to modify your review report. Lastly, for audit engagements, all disclosures are required, and if they're not going to actually be disclosed, you're going to have to give a qualified or adverse opinion. The difference here being qualified is not pervasive, adverse is pervasive, qualified is problematic. So if you have a disclosure about related parties that is just not there, but it's properly accounted for, you'll probably give a qualified opinion. Like the opinion, the financial statements are, are okay, except for this one disclosure. Adverse is something that's pervasive. For example, if the cash balance is completely messed up, that could affect other accounts and pervasive meaning it affects the financial statements as a whole, that would likely give you an adverse opinion. What about departures from GAAP? Well, in this case, for preparations, you may depart from GAAP, but you need to disclose in the financial statement that you did. In compilations, you're going to have to modify that report and to discuss the GAAP departure and why it was taken. Similarly here, for review engagements, you're going to modify that report to discuss that gap departure. And lastly, for audit engagements. Now, if it's a reasonable gap departure that was taken for the benefit of the readers of the financial statements, that's okay. If not, you're going to issue a qualified or adverse opinion. Independence is not required for preparations. It's a non-attest engagement. For compilations, it's not required, but disclosure is required if there is independence or if there's not. And independence is required for both reviews and audits because there is a level of assurance given. Next up here, engagement letter. This is presumptively mandatory, presumptively mandatory. Essentially, you're getting, like I said, think about it like this. You're entering into a contract to do work with someone. You're going to want an engagement letter, which is their contract. Representation letter. It's not required for preparations and compilations. However, this will be required for reviews and for audits. What about obtaining an understanding of internal control? That is not required for preparation. Compilations, that is not required. There's, there's no test work being done. Uh, now, for review engagements, it's required if you are going to do interim financial statements for a non-issuer or an issuer, but it is not required if you're doing an overall review for a non-issuer. Lastly, obviously required for audits. What about, what do we do for errors and irregularities if you find them? Well, you're not going to go looking for them, but preparations, yeah, if there's obvious errors, that is going to be what you're going to do something about. 
for compilations, you are only going to deal with obvious errors when found when you read the financial statements. For review engagements, only errors discovered through inquiry and analytical procedures will you address and make known. And lastly, you are going to conduct an audit. And that audit is going to be designed to provide reasonable assurance of detection of the material misstatement or of the issue. A couple more things here. Financial statements. What are you going to report on? The balance sheet, income statements, statement of retained earnings, and the statement of cash flows. Well, in this case, one or more financial statements may be prepared. For compilations, one or more financial statements allowed to be reported on. For our review engagement, one or more financial statements allowed if the scope of inquiry and analytical procedures have not been restricted. And lastly here for an audit engagement, one or more financial statements are allowed if the scope of the audit is not limited and all necessary procedures are applied. Lastly here, what about communication with the predecessor auditor? Not required. Similarly, inquiries of subsequent events are not required for preparation and compilation engagements. For review engagements, if you are doing a review engagement of a non-issuer, it is not going to be required that you communicate with the predecessor auditor. However, it will be required if you are going to conduct a interim financial statement review for non-issuers and issuers. And it is required that you make inquiries of subsequent events for our, all of our review engagements. And lastly, both of these are required for our audit engagement. Well, that was a good time. Make sure you are memorizing everything here. Keep powering through. You're doing quite well. I'm sure of it. You're working with us, right? Keep going. Have a smile on your face, and I will see you in our summary. Hey there, are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material? We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai, where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together.